said, you can't do that, said one of the critics. That doesn't bother me. Really? Again? Really? Look at that little enemy of God. Somehow we dilly and dally takes us years and we wonder why. What are you waiting for? Now, Brother Edward Algin, who works in the writing department, will present the next part entitled, A Problem and a Solution. Well, you brothers and sisters from the 155th class of Gilead are not only about to graduate, but will soon be heading toward your assignments, which we know you'll enjoy. But life being what it is, <laughs> you know problems occasionally arise. And one problem you might personally encounter somewhere down the road is you're still watching my response to the 155th Gilead graduation program. This program took place at the beginning of March 2024. Uh, you're watching basically um, a leaked version, which is the full, uh, what I watched and I'm responding to is the full version that is uh, unedited and that the Bethel family gets to see. And uh, an edited version of this program will be posted on jw.org as part of the June 2024 JW broadcasting episode. So you're getting a sneak peek behind the scenes and you will see some footage uh, as that I'll be showing that is edited out of the program that's posted to all Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, here we have a talk by Edward Algian, who has been introduced as a member of the writing department and his talk is entitled A Problem and a solution. So just very briefly about Edward Algian. So those of you, um, I'm probably showing my age here, but those of you that remember the beginnings of JW uh, broadcasting in the early in the early 2010s, so around 2014, um, they at, when they just started, they would post talks that were given to, I assume, the United States Bethel family by ordinary Bethelites who were not governing body members and who were not helpers to the governing body. And one of the early talks that they posted was by Edward Algian himself. And that talk was called An Important Reminder. And essentially, in that talk, Edward Algian shamed Jehovah's Witnesses who were wondering why Jehovah allows them to have problems like serious health problems, family problems, and so on, despite the fact that they were really taking the religion very seriously and they were um, questioning why Jehovah was not intervening on their behalf and protecting them from this program. And he gives this 45-minute uh, talk, which is effectively shaming any one of Jehovah's Witnesses who ever has those thoughts. And uh, it's interesting that he's doing something quite similar in this talk here. He calls a problem and a solution. Now, very interestingly, his opening remarks, which uh, maybe you've forgotten by now because of that long intro from me, and I apologize for that. But he is saying to these um, Gilead graduates, he's saying, uh, when you go back to your assignments, or when you go to your new assignments, you might you are likely to encounter this problem, this big problem, and he's he's really building it up. So I'm just wondering what that problem is. Could it be um, serious health issues on your part, or maybe on the part of a family member? Could it be something like a natural disaster? Could it be like um, serious uh, family problems? Uh, could it be uh, economic difficulties? I just wonder what this big problem is. Let's 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 let him introduce what that big problem is. Difficulty understanding an adjustment to an organizational or theocratic arrangement. It could be a change in our preaching methods, or in congregation operations, or in branch procedures, or or something like that. Wow. <laughs> well, I wasn't expecting that. So, you know, he's picking it up. You, you can face this big problem. So um, never mind natural disasters, never mind health issues, never mind financial difficulties that Jehovah's Witnesses are facing uh, all over the world, never mind civil unrest, war, and so on. Uh, the biggest problem, apparently, in Edward Algian's mind, the biggest problem any Jehovah's Witness might face, because obviously speaking 
speaking to the Gilead graduating class, but there's other Jehovah's Witnesses there, some, uh, I, I guess a good number who are not in Bethel that are watching the program. Jehovah's Witnesses all over the world will be forced to watch this program as part of the June 2024 JW broadcasting. But apparently in Edward Elgian's mind, the biggest problem you can face uh, as a Jehovah's Witness is when the leadership flip-flop on some policies and procedures. That's the biggest problem. That supersedes actual problems like health problems, marital problems, uh, financial difficulties, civil unrest, natural disasters. That supersedes all those problems. And again, this emphasizes the fact that the Jehovah's leadership the Jehovah's Witnesses leadership are clueless with regards to real world problems because they're in this bubble. Uh, the majority of them, in, pro, pro, presumably including Edward Algian, um, have no have had no real world experience in terms of having had to work hard to receive a, a an education, a college or university education. They haven't had to work in secular employment. They are completely looked after. All their needs are looked after at Bethel. And this is why these are the biggest problems that they face. And by the way, Edward Algian, as a member of the writing department, he is responsible for the uh, for some of the material that you see in the publications that Jehovah's Witnesses study at the Meeting. So the Watchtower study uh, material, the uh, material in publications like the Bearing Thorough Witness to the Truth they're studying now, Edward Algen likely as a long time senior member of the writing department has um, a very uh, massive input in the material that's published and the material that Jeho the Jehovah's Witnesses consume. And this is a man who has no idea of what's happening in the real world. This is the man that's giving advice and telling Jehovah's Witnesses how to lead their lives. Now, normally we appreciate these organizational refinements in harmony with Isaiah 60, 17, and yet our publications and even the Bible itself acknowledge that at some point any one of us might find it hard to make that transition from the way we had been doing something to the way we're now instructed to do it. Now, why would we find it difficult? Because it affects us personally? Uh, it changes where we serve or what we do? Maybe that. Maybe not that. Maybe it's just that mentally we're finding it hard to grasp the sense behind the change. We're loyal. We're, we're going to cooperate. But our brain keeps saying, why are we going in this direction? It seems to me we should be going in that direction instead. So this again shows the expectation on you as a Jehovah's Witness. You are just supposed to accept these changes, these policies, and they've actually said in their publications and even in talks that even if something seems illogical, even if something doesn't make sense, even if something is not strategic, as long as it's coming from the Jehovah's Witness leadership, you're just supposed to accept it. And there is a thing, Edward Daujian, there is a thing called critical thinking, critical skills. And these are the skills that when people go to college or to university, they are encouraged to in, um, in, engage with their critical thinking skills or improve their critical thinking skills. And it's because uh, people think critically. It's because of that that you, Edward Auji, and as a, um, a senior member of the religion, you can fly to parts of the country or maybe even other parts of the world in a few hours and give your indoctrination talks because somebody thought critically and they thought this um, sea travel is taking too long. Why don't we find a quicker way of doing it? And somebody invented the airplane. Now you, Edward Algy, and when you publish your when you write your, your articles in the Watchtower and other publications, you're able to transmit this very quickly electronically to, to Bethel was all over the world so that they can translate them. And it's because somebody thought critically and they created the internet as a quick uh, and easy and cheap effective way of communicating and, and transmitting information because people have developed critical thinking skills. If everybody just accepted the way things are done without um, challenging the status quo, so to speak, we would see no progress in society. But um, Edward Algian uh, thinks, well, that's obviously wrong. When you see something that doesn't make sense, even if you've been told for many, many years, even if you've been told for many, many years that it is a scriptural requirement to uh, 
report your hours of preaching in the ministry and the next day the leadership flip-flops and says well we've read the scriptures and we've discovered that we don't need to do that even if you've been an ardent defender of these policies and procedures you're just supposed to keep quiet shut up just accept it because it's coming from the leadership and not use any of your critical thinking skills well if we have been given new direction and mentally we're strongly inclined otherwise then we have a problem, but we also have a solution. But it took some Jewish Christians years to grow to the point where they could leave that law behind and fully adopt all aspects of Christianity. Why did it take them so long? Now, it's easy for us to say, well, they were stubborn. They had a bad attitude. And some of them did. There were some, for example, who wanted to hold on to parts of the law just to avoid persecution. So you had things like that going on. But think also of this. Prior to Christianity, the Mosaic law was Jehovah's arrangement for worship. So there must have been some Jewish worshipers who, before becoming Christian, were very loyal to the Mosaic law. And being of the loyal sort, what do you think they did? Just obey the law? No, they'd have taken it further. They'd have worked hard to cultivate uh, a strong appreciation for the law, a deep love for the way different features of the law reflected Jehovah's personality, his ways, his thinking. Perhaps some invested years bringing their appreciation up to that high level, and now that they had, the law suddenly goes out of effect. Now you can appreciate why it might have been hard for some loyal ones to process this change mentally. So, uh, I don't even know where to start from with the ridiculousness that um, Edward Algian is giving to the graduating 155th Gilead class or, and by extension to Jehovah's Witnesses all over the world. Uh, so he's basically appealing to the example in the scriptures where the, um, the arrangement of God was that the Mosaic Law, uh, the Mosaic Law was um, the standard uh, for worship and then Jesus came and uh, then Christianity came into place and therefore there was no requirement of uh, fulfilling the mosaic law to, to, to worship uh, God acceptably. Now the first thing I want to say is if, if we were just to take it on a surface level and we were to accept that um, thesis that Christianity came and it replaced the mosaic law and the uh, Christian way of worshipping is now the acceptable way of worshipping you still have an inspired thing, something that comes directly from God. So you've got Jesus, uh, the direct representative of God, um, giving his teachings that are recorded in the four gospels. And then you've got the apostles. So you've got uh, the apostle Paul, again, uh, directly selected by Jesus from the biblical accounts, um, inspired by God to write his letters. You've got other apostles that are writing. So you've got Peter writing. You've got other prominent disciples writing like uh, James uh, writing in, in, the, in the scriptures. So these people are, at least they're providing some proof of having this direct um, revelation from God that they're using to give guidance in, in the way people need to worship God now. But that is not the case with the governing body. Where is the proof that the governing body have been directly selected by God or by Jesus, or as they claim that they were appointed in 1919? And by the way, none of the members of the governing body was alive in 1919. Even their parents were probably well, for the majority of them, their parents were probably not even alive in 1919. So even if even if we were to accept that they were, um, uh, the, the faith when discreet slave was appointed in 1919, what claim does um, Ken Cook, uh, David Splain, Stephen Lett, Max Anderson, and so on have to show that they were, they've been directly appointed by Jesus? Now, the 1919 claim, again, there is no evidence. There is no evidence that Jesus uh, selected them in 1919. With the case of, say, the Apostle or Paul, you have Jesus speaking with him directly from heaven if, we, if you accept the account in Acts and selecting him as an apostle to the nations. The other apostles were directly 
um, selected by Jesus himself, but with the governing body, where is the proof that this arrangement has been selected by God and therefore you should accept this arrangement? And when they flip flop on things, again, it is just them as humans flip flopping. In the case of the transition from uh, Judaism to Christianity, you have God's direct intervention. But here, the governing body themselves, they can make a decision one day. They can say today, um, you're not supposed to have a beard, you're supposed to wear a tie to the meetings, uh, a woman is not supposed to wear uh, slacks or pants to meetings, and then the next day they can change their mind on that, and you're just supposed to accept that. You're just supposed to accept that. And how does the example in the scriptures um, where God is actually intervening and saying that um, uh, this arrangement has stopped and this is the new arrangement, how does that example apply to the governing body flip-flopping on their policies and procedures with Jehovah's Witnesses? And in the case of um, the actual example that he's appealing to, he's actually showing his lack of in-depth knowledge and understanding of what was happening in the first century. So in the first century, you actually have conflicting views in the actual Bible. So for example, if you take the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew actually says that the law would never be superseded. Matthew actually says that heaven and death will pass away before the smallest letter in um, the Hebrew alphabet um, uh, is, is wiped out, or the smallest letter in the law is wiped out. So Matthew is very much making a case for the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, to continue being um, uh, being followed as, as part of the worship. And in the case of um, the other early Christians, now uh, you've got the account in Acts where they write a letter um, saying that circumcision effectively is not required on people who are Gentiles and decide to become Christians. But that letter was not addressed to actual Jewish Christians. So Jewish Christians were still, in effect, required to uh, keep the tenets of the Mosaic law. And even the Apostle Paul himself acknowledges that because you've got the account in Acts where he goes back to Jerusalem and he shaves his head and he engages himself in these purification rituals, even though he... Um, you could say he was making a very strong case when he was among the Gentiles, but them not following the uh, Mosaic law. When he goes to Jerusalem, he's very much um, through and through a Jew in the sense that he's following all the tenets of the Mosaic law. So you've got, you've pretty much got a two-tier system here where in the first century they were making this compromise where they were saying people who are originally Jewish, they should continue following the Jewish a law, even though if they become Christians, but then that law is not required on the part of Gentiles who become Christians. That is what was happening in the first century. So he, even with that, something basic like that, somebody who is very high ranking in the Jehovah's Witness religion, somebody who is responsible or partly responsible for the production of the propaganda material that Jehovah's Witnesses consume, he's showing a very uh, uh, shallow um, if even I could say non-existent knowledge of what the actual scriptures say. Could something like that happen today? Yes, it could. Maybe you're taught years ago, this is how we preach and this is why. Right? Or this is how the congregation handles certain situations and this is why. Or this is how we view certain branch procedures and this is why it is the very best way. Now being of the loyal sort, what did you do? You made it all your own not just the arrangement itself, but the reasoning behind the arrangement. If somebody came along and challenged it, you loyally defended it, and maybe it took you years to bring your appreciation up to that high level, but loyally, you did. And now that you did, the arrangement changes. <laughs> and maybe even the reasoning behind the arrangement so sometimes you just have to laugh with some of these Jehovah's Witness speakers. So, so don't, doesn't this just make you wonder, is Edward Algie and perhaps uh, Pimo physically in, mentally out, is he one of those individuals that are just trapped in the system where he's dedicated his whole life to uh, this organization and now he's starting to want to maybe to wonder or even to question or even to think that this whole thing is just man-made and it's made up and, and he can just bring himself to remove himself from, from his position and from the religion because he has nothing to go to. He's invested his whole life in this religion and he, he, he has no savings, he has no qualifications, he's clearly an 
an older man, perhaps in his 60s uh, or, or even older, and, and he's just got nowhere to go. So he just has to go along with the flow. So he's actually been laughing at how ridiculous the whole thing is. So uh, when you're Jehovah's Witness, whether um, whether you're an elder or you're just a Jehovah's Witness, you have to defend these teachings. Like, I remember myself, one of the teachings I was staunch, staunchly defending as a Jehovah's Witness and as an elder is the requirement for reporting hours. I had a man in who was coming to the meetings, his wife was a witness and a pioneer, and he challenged that. And he says, well, where is it, does it say in the scriptures that you have to count the time you spend in the ministry and, and you have to report it? And I was very, um, um, robustly defending um, these policies and, and then they just pull the rug from underneath your feet and then they say well we, we don't need to do that anymore and the same is true with the disfellowshipping arrangement which they've recently changed now where they've made it um, more lenient um, they've made it easier for people to come back they've made it harder for people effectively to be disfellowshipped and in the past you as an elder had to defend those policies you had to enforce the shani if you saw um family members interacting with their family member even if it's just the slightest interaction with a, a disfellowship family member at the meeting or or in another setting you had to go and challenge them on that and and show them from the publications and the scriptures why that conduct was unacceptable and overnight the leadership can just say well th that's not the way to do it and this is the scripture way to do it and they will give different reasoning and you just have to accept that and and how jian <laughs> i don't know whether he, that's like um you know, some kind of a Freudian sleep, or maybe he's doubting this stuff himself. He's actually laughing at how ridiculous it is that you or you had to, first of all, uh, try to understand something that doesn't make sense and then get to a point where you can be a staunch defender of it and then overnight they will just pull the rag from underneath your feet. Well, like some of those early Jewish Christians, your very loyalty to a previous theocratic arrangement might make it hard to grasp immediately the wisdom behind the new adjustment. If we ever have a problem understanding an adjustment to a theocratic arrangement, we also have a solution. Philippians 3.13. Be patient, walk orderly, and stay busy in our theocratic routine. Now, I would like to conclude by illustrating that last point the value of staying busy in our theocratic routine. Because it is the solution, not just to what we're talking about right now, it is the solution to several situations in life. Now the illustration is one that I heard several years ago at a Gilead graduation program. How about that? <laughs> one of your instructors told us about the old steamboats that used coal for fuel, right? So upstairs you had the captain and the crew, downstairs you have these men busy shoveling coal into the ship's boiler, right? Now imagine one of these workers puts his shovel down and he approaches a co-worker and says, hey, did I just detect the ship starting to make a left turn? That does not seem right to me. Seems that at this point of the trip, we should be moving straight forward, not changing direction. I wonder if the captain really knows what he's doing. You know what? I'm going to go upstairs and have a word with the captain. Now, at this point, the speaker stopped describing the scene. He just leaned forward close to the microphone, and he, he simply said, shovel the coal. <laughs> oh, that's you and me, right? That's you and me. We are shoveling the coal. We're, we're busy doing the work Jehovah assigned us to do. That's what we're absorbed in. We let Jehovah take care of Isaiah 60, 17, the copper, the gold, the silver. We take care of the coal by staying absorbed and busy in our theocratic routine. And then, as Jehovah navigates his organization, he'll also navigate us to the right attitude, to con uh, to con to contentment and to that most wonderful adjustment of all from this system to life in the new world. Well, we thank you very much, Brother Algin, for that uh, three-part solution to a very realistic problem. Uh, so, so apparently, uh, the flip-flopping 
uh, on policies, procedures, and doctrines among the Jehovah's Witnesses is is a is a very realistic problem, according to Ken Cook. So again, he's reiterating what Edward Algian was saying at the uh, at, at the beginning of his talk. But this is one of the biggest problems that the Jehovah's Witnesses would encounter: how to deal with these. Um, yeah, this flip-flopping on the Jehovah's Witness leadership. And just on the point of the flip-floppings, uh, I saw somebody posted on Twitter uh, the, the other day that this new adjustment where people are allowed to greet people who come to the meetings, this was actually a teaching in, back in 1974. So they've just gone back to what they were teaching in 1974. So how is this progressing from uh, from copper to gold and so on uh, when that Edward Algian is uh, is appealing to here there in the scripture in Isaiah 60 verse 17. So if they had this understanding back in 1974, then they changed their mind and then they've gone back to what they were teaching in 1974. How is that progress in any way, shape or form? And I also found it very interesting that um, his audience found this um, anecdote that he's telling, they found it very amusing and I, I just didn't find anything amusing in that and I found it actually quite irritating. So this is one thing that the Jehovah's Witness leaders invariably tend to do where they equate what has been said in the Jehovah's Witness literature and what has been said by the leaders of the religion to actual scripture. So he could have used the final uh, couple of minutes of his talk to reinforce a scriptural point, to read the scripture, to illustrate the scripture and to to apply to his audience, but uh, apparently that does not hold as much weight as re re relating something that was said by a Gilead instructor at a Gilead graduation program. So that's the most powerful thing. That's the most powerful takeaway that he wants these graduation, uh, graduating students to take away is what was said at the previous graduating program. And what that person had said that Algian is relating here is has no scriptural basis. So he's talking about a situation where you notice some kind of a danger. So you notice that the ship, the, the ship captain is leading the ship in the direction that you don't expect to be going. So instead of you challenging that, you're just told to shovel the coal. So shut up and just get on with it is basically the message that you're being given. Now, if everybody accepted that in life, then so many people would end up in so many difficulties or they would end up um, experiencing problems that they would otherwise avoid if they could if they challenge things so uh, for example if if you were in, in a taxi and you notice that the driver is just taking you on a route that is not familiar to you and that is not headed in the direction that you're supposed to be heading to so you're just supposed to accept that you're just supposed to sit there quietly and accept just because he's the taxi driver uh, if you are a patient in a healthcare system and you notice some malpractices among the doctors the nurses the the the, the uh, medical personnel you're just supposed to sit sit there be quiet and accept that because these are medical personnel uh, and not challenge things so, it's, so if everybody accepted that and uh, how, how how is that a, how is that good advice how is that sensible advice and even in the actual scriptures if people uh, there's a scripture that they Jehovah's Witnesses constantly um, use, the leadership use, when they're trying to push the, forward the agenda. They, the scripture is in, uh, in, in Proverbs where they say, I think it's Proverbs 22 verse 3, where it says shrewd, uh, the shrewd person uh, sees the calamity and, and he tries to avoid it or something along those lines. Uh, so this, the scriptures themselves say, when you notice that something is going in a direction that might lead to trouble, you're supposed to act. You're supposed to protect yourself from the danger. But Algian is actually telling uh, Jehovah's Witnesses the opposite of that. So I just wonder, how is that good advice? But you can't do that, said one of the critics. That doesn't bother me. Really? Again? Really? Look at that little enemy of God. Somehow we dilly and dally takes us years and we wonder why. What are you waiting for?